how pleasurable does it feel in the moment? How enjoyable does that behavior or activity actually feel when you're doing it? Over a third of participants said that they would happily wash all their dishes, hand wash all their dishes rather, for the rest of their life. They didn't have to exercise ever again. Before we dive into today's episode of the Mental Wellbeing College, an important disclaimer. We do dive into the wheeze of mental health, which means that at times we discuss sensitive topics like suicide, self-harm and substance abuse. If hearing such discussion does bring up distress for you, please do seek the psychological and professional treatment that you need. The content covered in this episode is not intended as a substitute for professional mental health treatment. Have you ever wondered why we do so many unhealthy behaviors despite knowing that they're unhealthy for us? Or why we don't engage in the healthy behaviors that we know do bring benefits for us? For example, anywhere from 33 to 80% of the population is physically inactive. This is despite the vast majority of the population knowing that physical activity is good for us. The same phenomenon can be said for many of the health behaviors we know are bad for us. For example, scrolling on our phone all the way right up until bedtime or eating that whole block of chocolate when we know we really only should be eating that one square or just that one row. This phenomenon also partly underlies why so many New Year's resolutions fail within the first two months of a new year. In health psychology, we call this term the intention behavior gap or I like to borrow a term from implementation science called the no-do gap. So if more knowledge isn't the issue, why does so much of the public health promotion, health behavior change messaging hinge on telling us more about the benefits of certain behaviors or the risks of certain behaviors? Why is it that when a partner or a friend tells us that they're not getting enough sleep or they're not exercising enough, our first reaction is, typically to tell them why they should be doing it because exercise is good for x y and z outcome or if you don't get enough sleep remember a b and c is going to happen so the truth is is that there are several factors that explain this phenomenon and contribute to the intention behavior gap or the no do gap but one of the real keys lies in a really fascinating experiment by carolina verla and colleagues in 2016. so in this experiment participants were told to go for a walk that was mapped out for them. They had to go for this walk, follow the map, and return, and then they were given some food afterwards. Except participants in condition A were told that they were walking for exercise. So priming more of the rational benefits that come along with exercise when we think of it, all the good stuff that comes in terms of the health benefits. Whereas condition B, the participants were told just to walk for fun priming more of the enjoyment and in the moment affective or enjoyable outcomes. So what we observed after was pretty fascinating that the participants in condition A at the buffet after the war ate much more unhealthy food. They reported feeling more fatigued during the walk and had a lower mood. They ate twice as many M&Ms when given a choice as to how much to eat versus the participants in condition A. B, which was just walk for fun. So just by simply framing physical activity in a different way, framing just a very simple walk in a different way, they actually saw a change in physical outcomes in self-reported psychological state just from that one little change. Now, what does this tell us? Well, there's a really important lesson here from this experiment and from a bunch of new health behavior change theories that I'm going to share with you that may just help you engage in more of those healthy behaviors it may be the missing link taking you from an intention to actual behavioral action in things like exercise and healthy eating so often when we're trying to make behavior change when we're trying to exercise eat healthy get better sleep we look at it more in terms of the rational benefits why it's going to be good for us what it's going to do for our future yet we neglect a really important feature which is the role of affect a-f-f-e-c-t that is How pleasurable does it feel in the moment? How enjoyable does that behavior or activity actually feel when you're doing it? So whenever we're at a decision point between two health behaviors, whenever we're contemplating going to the gym or staying at home, 
eating the salad or eating the high calorie, high sugar dessert. Often we're doing these behaviors with the intention of helping ourselves with a rational, reasonable health related behavior or health related outcome. Things like reducing our risk of cancer, reducing our risk of cardiovascular disease, controlling our blood sugar levels, getting helping our, our memory and cognition for better sleep. But have a think about what all of these outcomes, things that we're thinking about at the moment when we're at these decision points, what do they all have in common? So typically what they have in common is that they're all far off, distant outcomes, way off into our future where we don't actually see meaningful progress on unless it's been weeks or months or sometimes even years of doing it. And you typically don't get feedback that you're improving your memory and cognition immediately, that you're reducing your blood sugar immediately, or that you're reducing your risk of cancer immediately. These things take time to actually see effect in a clinically noticeable, meaningful way to us. Yet we do get quick, immediate feedback in another way, momentary, moment-to-moment feedback. And that is how pleasurable, how enjoyable is that behavior when we're doing it? But often our health behaviors are not enjoyable in the moment. They're boring or they're uncomfortable. We'd rather lay out on the couch after a long day at work than have to go to the gym and slog it out on a treadmill or boringly lift some weights. And to this point, there's a really interesting poll by one poll, a market research agency in the States, and they asked a few thousand Americans, what would you rather do if you didn't have to exercise ever again? And over a third of participants said that they would happily wash all their dishes, hand wash all their dishes rather, for the rest of their life. They didn't have to exercise ever again. Over a third stated that they'd happily spend a weekend with their in-laws. A third said that they'd rather text the next. A quarter said that they'd cancel Netflix for a year, all of which if they didn't have to exercise ever again. And equally in that poll, 50% of people said that they just don't like exercise as much as they'd like to like it because they just don't enjoy it. More than 50% said that they mentally check out of their workouts or their exercise because it's just boring. And I think this really speaks to one of the problems with exercise and trying to make it a habitual, consistent behavior for us. It's difficult to do that, to go from sedentary, to go from an inconsistent exerciser to a consistent one when It's just boring and you don't actually enjoy it in the moment. Particularly if you're in that habit building phase or you're trying to make exercise consistent, it can take a lot of self-discipline, a lot of willpower and self-regulation to drag yourself to the gym, to go for a walk after a long day at work. And that's difficult to do on a normal day, let alone when you're stuck in the minutiae of life and you throw in a busy work week, kids, responsibilities to look after your house, relationship. When you're in the minutiae of things, it can get difficult to show that self-regulation to build things into a habit unless you're already a habitual exerciser or you have that identity of I am an exercise person. So it can be difficult to willpower your way to a workout in this stage of behavior change. So if we come back to the intention behavior gap, we have this fight and this conflict between on the one hand, this long-term health outcome that's pulling us towards exercising. Then we have the immediate affective feelings of exercise, which is it's unpleasurable, it's not enjoyable, and that pushes us away from doing exercise. And those two are in conflict in this constant tug of war against each other. So what's the solution here? How can we flip from a conflict and tug of war between two opponents to a dance between two partners in tandem? So one of the big solutions here is to make the behavior more affectively pleasing. That is, make it more enjoyable in the moment so that when you're at those decision points, when you're contemplating having the salad versus the chocolate bar or exercise versus stay on the couch, not only do you have the long-term health benefits motivating you and pulling you towards exercising, but you also have the very fact that it's just going to be something that it's going to be really enjoyable and you want to do it just because it's fun and you get the health benefits as a bonus. And that way you have two of these factors pulling you towards it 
rather than that tug of war, push, pull conflict. And this is really supported by lots of research in the affective health behavior change space. So for example, an experiment by David Williams and co-authors, a really cool experiment shows this where they had participants go for a little walk on a treadmill and they asked these participants whilst they were walking, how are you feeling? From minus five, not pleasurable at all, to five, very pleasurable, how are you feeling? So this, this scale they call the feeling scale. And what they found was that a one point increase on that scale between that minus five and plus five, a one point increase actually predicted up to 40 minutes of exercise extra per week when they followed up with the participants six months later and even predicted over 20 minutes extra per week when they followed up with the participants a year later. So this really shows that if you're enjoying exercise in the moment that it can actually lead to you doing more of it in a pretty sustainable way six and 12 months later in this particular experiment. And it's for this very reason that many of the world's habit change experts, many of whom I've had on this podcast, always consistently say that one of the biggest tips to making a health behavior habitual is to ensure that the behavior itself is enjoyable in the moment. To that point, let's tune into a chat I had with Dr. Pippa Lally, a leading habit researcher at the University of Surrey, where she talks just about how important making things affectively pleasing in the moment is for building habits. From the, the neuropsychology literature, we know that if things are more rewarding, literally as you do them, that speeds the habit formation process. So that's definitely a good idea to try and make it rewarding, but it needs to be rewarding at that time. So it's not at the end of the day, I say, oh, did I do that thing today? Yes, I did. Now I get whatever my reward is. It's about trying to make the behavior as rewarding as possible in the moment, which a lot is, is about choosing what the behavior is. So trying, if I absolutely hate running, have always hated running, believe I will always hate running, trying to form a running habit seems like a pretty bad idea. Not that running isn't really good for you, but there are other forms of exercise that you might enjoy more that it would be more sensible to try and form a habit. So a real takeaway from today's episode to overcome that no-do gap to beat that tug of war between a behavior you know you should be doing versus what you're actually doing is to make the intended behavior enjoyable, pleasing, affectively pleasing in the moment when you're doing it. So have a think about your own health behaviors. For example, if you're trying to kick a, an ice cream or a chocolate habit at night, like I was trying to kick months ago, is there a better healthier alternative that actually still tastes good that you can have. For example, I found these lovely little low calorie biscuits and that helped me curb cravings for having a full on ice cream or chocolate at night. Still tastes good in the moment though. If you're trying to make exercise a consistent behavior, are there variables you can change to make it more enjoyable? For example, if you hate running on a treadmill inside in a sweaty big box gym, can you go for a jog at a local park amongst greenery and nature? Or if you find going to the gym and lifting weights boring, can you listen to a podcast or can you go with a mate so that you get a chance to have some stimulating talk whilst also pumping out some iron? So you may, may just find that making your health behaviors that little bit more affectively pleasing, enjoyable in the moment is that last domino that you need to fall in place for you to start to make the target behavior consistent. So for a full lowdown into the science of making exercise affectively pleasing in the moment, I did an awesome chat with Professor Ryan Rhodes from the University of Victoria in Canada, which you can check out and we'll link in the show notes. And also recently just recorded a cool discussion with Dr. Megan Tachinet from Deakin University in Australia on how you can make exercise better and more enjoyable, but also better for your mental health in the moment. So you can check that out too, or else look out for our 10 minute lifestyle psychiatry dive into specific strategies that you can use to make exercise more enjoyable, which will be dropping in November.